Well, good morning to Pastor John and James River Campus. Good morning to my Buford Road Campus family, and good morning to all you online. My name is Mac Jordan, and I'm honored to be here today to say, God is good. And all the time? Well, church, as my beard grows whiter, I have come to learn the importance of six simple words. Be careful what you ask for. Two weeks ago, Pastor Tom asked me to preach today, and he said, Mac, I want you to cover a story of Moses that I am not covering in this sermon series. So I looked at what he had covered before, and I looked at where he was going, and I decided to land on the most perfect story, the story of the golden calf. And the reason why that is perfect is it is sandwiched between the giving of the Ten Commandments and the wandering in the wilderness. And I thought, this is perfect. And more to that, people know this story. People know it from the movies. People know it from history class and religion class. And people know it from church and synagogue and the mosque. It is a well-known story. And I remember thinking to myself at the time that this is a good story also because it will preach. It will preach itself. I don't have to do much. I just have to show up talk about it, and then leave. It'll be easy to write and easy to preach, and and I should know better than to think those thoughts. After two stints in seminary, you would have thought I would have known better than to think those thoughts, because anytime a pastor thinks that, God always shows up with a big old holy hand, and he slaps that pastor for thinking those thoughts, because Exodus 32 is not for the faint of the heart. Exodus 32 is one of the hardest chapters to read in the Bible. It is filled with anger, betrayal, and a cry for revenge. Walter Brueggemann, a very famous author and Old Testament scholar, once said about Genesis, I mean about Exodus 32, that it is a recasting of Genesis 3, in that this chapter depicts the fall of a people who reject God for their own desires. Exodus 32 reminds us, of, reminds us of how fallen we are as a people. Not to mention, this is such a letdown. We have read from chapters 20 to 31 how God loves his people. We get to join Moses on top of the mountain And we get to see how God invests his time, how God invests his energy, how God invests his heart into his people. He made a covenant to be with them. He promised them a land way out there, a land that he would guide them to, that he would secure for them, and that they would prosper. And then you get to chapter 32. And what do we find? The people betraying God. Completely heartbreaking. Not to mention that chapter 32 is also a character study. It is a deep character study of humanity, of us and the Jews. It is also a character study of Moses, as well as a character study of God himself. If you ever want to understand God in the Old Testament point of view, read Exodus 32. So church, I have learned the importance of six simple words. Be careful what you ask for. So I invite you to join me in reading Exodus 32. I'm going to be reading sections of it. And I want to share with you all that I have learned this week. Because there is much. I could really preach three sermons from this chapter alone. A sermon on the golden calf. A sermon on the conversation between God and Moses. And a sermon on the difference between God's judgment and Moses' judgment. But I only have this Sunday because Pastor Tom will be back next week. So I'm just going to focus on the golden calf and share what I've learned. And the first thing that I've learned is that all of my life, I believe that the golden calf was created by the Jews to replace God. I learned that from a little boy. I was brought up that they were tired of waiting from God to come down from the mountain. So they built their own God. But if you read the scripture, there's more to this. Than meets the eye. Read with me, Exodus 32, verse 1. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. 
As for this fellow Moses who brought us out, up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Now focus on some key words. Moses and gods, the plural. Focus on that as we jump down to verse 5. Listen to this. They've already built the golden calf. And then we enter into the scene. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. Now let me pause here. Lord in English can mean many things. It can mean the Lord our God. It can also be a title we put on someone who is wealthy, someone who has uh, property, someone who has political gain. I mean, we don't use it much in America, but it is a big British term that has been used. Also, it can mean a pagan god. It can mean a demigod. It can mean a god that we don't recognize as a god, but others do. So Lord can mean many things. So when I come across scriptures like that, I often think, okay, they're speaking about the golden calf. But let me go back to the Hebrew and see what the Hebrew said. And this is what it actually says. Aaron said, tomorrow is to be a feast for Adonai. Now, Adonai is the name that the Jews gave to God because they believed that Yahweh was too holy to say. God gave, him that, God gave himself that name, and because of that, the Jews believed they couldn't say it. That only on special occasions, like a high religious holiday, could a priest say the name of Yahweh. So they gave God the name of Adonai, which means Lord and Creator. And this is a special name for the Jews for God. So here's the question, church. Why would the Jews build a golden calf one day? And then offer sacrifices from it to God the next day. It makes no sense. And why do they use the term gods and not God? Pay attention. Could it be that Aaron nor the Jews never meant to replace God with the golden calf, but rather they meant to replace Moses with the golden calf? Could it be that they put Moses on a pedestal so high that they believed that he was a god? Now hang in there with me. I'm stretching you a little bit. Hang in there with me. Remember where the Jews came from. They came from Egypt, right? They came from a land where Pharaoh spoke on behalf of the gods to the people. In fact, he was called the mediator of the gods. He was a demigod who spoke to the gods for the people and to the people from the gods. And so he was the mediator between heaven and earth. And then came Moses. And Moses said, Pharaoh, I am the mediator of the one true God. And my God said, let my people go. And so they clashed, and the Jews saw Moses turn the Nile to blood. They saw Moses bring frogs and, and bulls and even an angel of death. That killed the firstborn of every child in Egypt. They even saw him part the Red Sea. So in the minds of the Jews, Moses became the new Pharaoh. Moses took the status of a demigod. And can you blame them? If I saw that, I would do the same as well. They only understood what their cultural understanding could help them understood. And so they placed Moses on a pedestal and they said that his words and his actions were the very words and actions of God. Now, you don't think we're guilty of doing that today, do you? You don't think in a time of celebrity preachers and teachers and politicians that we don't quote these people more than or just as much as scripture, do you? You don't think that we lift them up so high that the only place that they can go is down. You don't think that in a presidential election year, we don't post signs in our front yard saying that this is the only thing that's going to save our country when we know that only Jesus Christ can do that. We got to be careful in how we judge the Jews here, church, because we are just as guilty of building golden calves but we we mask it in the name of Christianity. This is my Christian golden calf, so it's okay, right? Remember, they weren't trying to replace God, but they do actually replace God because they put something before them and they say, this is actually who we're following. But why do they do that? Why would they create a golden calf? Because Moses was taking too long in coming down. 
And they looked around and they said, we're not in Egypt anymore. I don't know this land. I don't know any of these peoples. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what this looks like. And I'm scared. And my leader is not coming down. Where is he? So they turned to Aaron and said, Aaron, we know that you cannot lead because it's evident in everything you do. So build us a golden calf, something that we know, something that is familiar, something that looks right. And so they do. They build it because they want this golden calf to go before them to be another God that they can follow. Another God that they can put their hope in because it is familiar. Because deep down inside, the Jews want to return back to Egypt. Now that sounds silly to us. I mean, doesn't it sound good that they're no longer in Egypt? Doesn't it sound good that they are no longer slaves? Doesn't it sound good that they are no longer under the thumb of Pharaoh? Well, what sounds good might not feel good. What sounds good might not feel good. Think about life before the pandemic. Every teenager says, I don't want to go to school. I want to stay home. Every adult says, I don't want to go to work today. I'd rather spend time at home. Every parent's like, I just want to see my children more. Every Christian says, I just want to slow down and spend some quiet time with God. And then a pandemic hits. And what do we do? I can't believe this is happening. I got to get to the office. I got to get to school. I don't want to see you, kid, anymore. Sorry, my child's over there. Uh, (laughs) And... We, we became so anxious, we became so angry, we became so focused on the inside because we longed to return back to the very place we came from. We, what we talked about sounded good, but when it happened, it did not feel good at all. And listen to me, I long for the day that I could come to church and not wear a mask. I long for the day I can go to the restaurant and not wear a mask. I long for the day that I can watch football. Can I get an amen? (laughs) But I've learned, church, be careful what you ask for. For we are no longer in Egypt. We are at the very foot of the mountain of God. And God is up there and he is working. And the question is, is what are you doing while God is working? How are you spending your time waiting? What are you building? right now. You see, when we're outside of Egypt, we have two natural responses, two natural emotions that come to us in this time. The first one is fear. We are afraid of the unknown. Can I get an amen? Because when we face the unknown, we begin to ask questions. What's going to happen to my family? What's going to happen to my job? What's going to happen to my income? What's going to happen to my nation and my world? And then that question starts spiraling, and then it comes to you. And you start to ask questions of yourself. What will make me happy? What will make me content? What will protect me? And then suddenly, we're not focusing on God anymore. We're focusing on ourselves. And we start worshiping ourselves. And all everything is driven to me. And so what do we do when we do that? We place stuff in front of us that is comfortable. That makes us feel better. That will get us to our end goal, which is protection of the self. And this leads to the very second reaction, which is impatience. Can I get an amen that we are an impatient people? We are impatient. We are designed by our culture to be impatient. I can go to this iPad right now, and I can type into Google a question, and it could give me an answer like that. I could talk to Alexa at my kitchen table. It's not my kitchen table. It's just an illustration. And say, play this song. Give me this answer. And it will give me that answer immediately. I can order a new TV today. Can I do that, Amy? No. All right. Well, I could hypothetically order a new TV today. And it will be at my house in two days. We are driven to be impatient. Just think about a diet. There's nothing harder to me than going on a diet. If you were to ask me, Mac, or tell me, Mac, for the next 30 days, you cannot have a cheeseburger. Guess where my mind's going to go to? A cheeseburger. I mean, just picture it. Just picture it. A grilled beef patty, cheddar cheese, sesame seed bun, lettuce, tomato, onion, ketchup, mustard, what have you. If you're a vegetarian, I'm sorry for this illustration. 
Imagine holding that into your hands and putting that to your mouth. Imagine smelling that cheeseburger right now. And then you start to say, well, I can get one today, and then I can work extra hard tomorrow to work it off. Or, oh, maybe I can invite a friend, and we can go, and, of course, we'll just go to, like, Burger Batch or, or Johnny Rockets, and the only thing they serve is burgers, so this will work, right? We begin to scheme. We begin to plan. And if we're not careful, we will break our diet. If we're not careful, we will find ourselves unfaithful because we are impatient. I love the quote from Terence Furtham when he wrote, and I think this is what really gets through the heart of the matter, when he wrote these words. When the word of God is delayed or rare or maybe is not the word we want to hear. When God's presence is only known in God's absence. We say we have waited long enough, or at least we say we have waited long enough for this God. We begin seeking a new God. And like the Israelites, we usually go for a God we can get our hands on. A God more readily accessible to human reason. Say, or a God less demanding of our time and loyalty. Sounds about right, doesn't it? When we get afraid, when we get tired, we turn to something else. Instead of Adonai, who is on top of the mountain. You see, church, we still have the problem the ancient Jews had. It's a matter of trust. We struggle with trust. We struggle in trusting God. We struggle in trusting that he has our best interest at heart. And because we struggle with these things, we have a hard time not creating idols for ourselves. Because we long to go back to a life before a pandemic, don't we? We long to go back to yesterday, to busy schedules, to having everything just kind of dictate our lives. But God never calls us out of Egypt just to send us back to Egypt. You need to hear me. God never calls you out of Egypt to send you back to Egypt. God calls you out of Egypt to stand at the mountain of God as he is preparing you to move to the promised land. And I believe he is preparing us right now. I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And so therefore, right now, God is preparing your hearts, my heart, and my mind for the future. But the question is, is will you follow him? Will you follow God? Because the essential sin, the foundational sin of the golden calf is a lack of faith in God. A belief that God does not have your best interests at heart. A belief that God does not care for you or love you. That God will fail you. That is where this sin comes from. It's a faith in yourself instead of a faith in God. And what is truly heartbreaking about this is that in Exodus 32, God is on top of the mountain planning a wedding while his people are at the bottom of the mountain planning a divorce. God is at the top of the mountain planning a wedding with his people, a covenant with his people, and his people are at the bottom of the mountain planning a divorce. We don't want you, God, anymore. We want another God. We want to put leaders in front of us. And it's because of that lack of trust that we do lift up political leaders, religious leaders. We we lift them up to replace God, never intending to replace God. They never intended to replace God with Moses, but it just happened because they put everything into Moses because we love to build our own kings. We love to build our own queens. This is a theme that will be echoed time and time again in Scripture. This is a matter of faith. This is a matter of trust. Before the 12 disciples of Jesus became disciples, there were 12 men. Jesus came to them and gave them a call. He said, follow me. Now, they had a decision to make. They could follow him or they could remain, and they decided to follow him. And for the next three years, their world was rocked. They got to see Jesus perform amazing miracles, and then they had to see him flee crowds that wanted to kill him. They saw him preach prophetic messages, and then they saw him crucified publicly. From the outside looking in, it looked like the ministry of Jesus was a complete failure. It appeared as if these men had wasted three years of their lives. But then Jesus rose from the dead. 
And he looked at these men and he said, you didn't know every, everything that was happening. You didn't understand all that was occurring. But I promised you in the beginning, and I promise you now, that I will always be with you. That I will always be for you. And that I am good. And I believe that Jesus says those words right now. Jesus might not be giving us all the answers we want today. But he is giving himself. On the darkest nights. On the brightest mornings. On the long days. On the good days. He is with you. And the question is, is is that enough? Is that enough? Is that enough for you? To follow him. So I end my sermon not with answers. But with a question. Will you follow him? It's a matter of faith. It's a matter of trust. As you wait at the bottom of the mountain of God. How are you spending your time? Is it trying to move on without God? Building your own calves? Or is it trusting that he's going to lead you in the right way? So church, I invite you to join me and follow Jesus.